all of you. And so if you were here last Sunday or you watched online, you remember the fire. Well, the fire is back. The fire is back. And the reason it's back is is very simple. I think it's important sometimes for us, especially those of us who are visual learners, to have something that we can anchor into. When we hear these stories from the text, when we hear these great truths and principles from Scripture, sometimes it just helps, doesn't it, to have an image or a symbol or something that you can see that it then becomes a part of your thinking and then hopefully becomes a part of your way of living. And so I think it's important sometimes for us to do this. So we brought back the fire. It's really warm up here. And last Sunday, you might remember that we made the point that we all know, and that is that fires can be destructive. When we face the fires in life, it can be difficult. Fires can be devastating because sometimes when you play with fire, you might get what? Burned. That's right. Or in trouble with your parents, either way. And so fires can be dangerous, fires can be devastating, and we face fires all the time in life. Have you ever been burned? I mean literally burned. We've had, and I've had a couple of close calls. I remember several years ago, we were camping, the three of us were camping, and we woke up that morning and we built a campfire, much like this one, except for the extension cord. We built a campfire, and we were going to make breakfast over the campfire. There is nothing better when you're camping than to cook breakfast over the fire. And so we were cooking eggs, and we had bacon cooking. And the problem was we were cooking this bacon on a griddle that didn't have a very big lip around it. Not good. Because when that bacon began to cook, the grease began to form, and pretty soon that griddle couldn't hold that grease in, and that grease came over the side of the griddle. Do you know what happens when hot grease meets hot flames? (laughs) Whoosh! I mean, we had a firestorm. We all jumped back from the fire. We're checking our extremities. We're looking at each other's eyebrows to make sure we still have eyebrows. And then we assess the damage to the most important thing, and that is our bacon. The griddle is completely busted, cracked apart. Part of it's in the fire, part of it's outside the fire. Most of the bacon, unfortunately, was in the fire. The eggs were gone. However, there were still a couple of pieces of bacon stuck to the parts of the griddle outside the fire. And I thought, we can salvage that. After all, it's bacon. And so I peeled those pieces of bacon off of those pieces of griddle, and I tasted a couple of bites of that bacon. Ooh. It was bad, bad bacon. It tasted like bacon that came from a pig that had chain-smoked its whole life. (laughs) Bad bacon. Not good. So I think we ended up having powdered sugar donuts for breakfast that morning. But it's a good lesson to learn. Fire can be dangerous. We tell our kids that. Don't play in fire because it can be dangerous. You can be hurt. And so as we continue to look at the life of Peter, but more importantly, use Peter's perspective to look at Jesus and to interact with Jesus, we see Peter get burned by the fire. He was at that fire in the chief priest's courtyard warming himself when he is confronted with his allegiance to Christ. Hey, aren't you with Jesus? And you know the story. You know what happened. Peter said, no, I don't know him. When the heat became intense, Peter's faith melted away. He abandoned Jesus. He denied him three times. I want you to listen to Luke's account of the story. On the third denial, Luke chapter 22, verse 60, Peter replied when asked, aren't you with Jesus? Man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word that the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. When the heat was turned up, Peter's faith did not last. 
It melted away. And I want you to put yourself in Peter's shoes for a moment. How do you feel in that moment? Well, in that moment, you're just trying to survive. We've all been there. You do something, you say something to save yourself, to save your image, to save the perception people have of you, maybe to save your own life. But then right after that, the regret begins to set in. The guilt begins to set in. And you think, what did I do? What did I say? I can't believe I did that. I mean, for all Peter knows, this is the last time he's going to see Jesus. And he looks into his eyes. And when Jesus looks at him, what does he see? He sees the guy that abandoned him, that denied him. That's what he sees. Can you imagine the guilt? Can you imagine the regret? You see, facing the fires of life can be extremely difficult. And some of you know this because you've been through the fires. Maybe you are going through the fires, the fires of temptation, the fires of anger or pride or lust or the fire of loss, or of social pressure. You know what it's like to go through the fires. Will your faith hold up? You see, those fires often cause us to do regrettable things, and we are left with guilt. But as we continue to use this symbolism of fire, it's important for us to acknowledge that sometimes fire does good work, doesn't it? I mean, you can warm yourself by the fire when you're cold. Fire can produce energy. Fire can save a life. And so sometimes fire does good work. In John's gospel, we see a couple of fire stories that I think are paired together. I think, inspired by the Holy Spirit, John presents these stories in a way so that we read them together, so that we view them as partners. When you look at John's account in John chapter 18, you see a detail about the fire that Peter was warming himself beside in the courtyard of the high priest. John 18, 18, the literal translation reads this way, the servants and the officers were standing there having made a fire of coals because it was cold. Now the NIV doesn't even include that detail. This is a literal translation of that text. Your NIV probably doesn't even mention that. Some of your versions probably do. But think about that. Why was that detail included? Fire is mentioned throughout the New Testament. Literal fire and also symbolic or figurative fire. But there's only one other place, only one other place that this detail, this fire of burning coals, is used to describe the fire. And it's three chapters later in John chapter 21. After Jesus has been crucified, after he's been raised to life, resurrected, there is some unfinished business that Jesus wants to take care of. And so we find him on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. What does he do? He builds a fire of burning coals. Here's the story. It's in John chapter 21, if you want to look at it. After Peter denied Jesus, Jesus is crucified by those Jewish leaders and approved by the Roman government. He dies on that cross, and he is put in that tomb. But Jesus isn't like other would-be messiahs. There had been other people come along claiming to be the messiah, and they were killed for that claim, and you never heard from them again. But Jesus was different. Death wouldn't stop Jesus. The cross wouldn't silence him. And the grave would not be his final resting place. That tomb would only be a portal of God's power and God's divine plan to bring redemption and salvation to all the world. And so Jesus is raised from the dead. God raises Jesus from the dead. And he appears to people. And that's important because It tells us and assures us that this is not just a spiritual event. This is a historical event. People saw with their own eyes the resurrected Jesus. God raised him from the dead. And that fact, that truth, 
that reality should give you great joy. It should fill you with a sense of incredible hope. No matter what you're going through, the fact that Jesus walked out of that tomb should fill you with a sense of peace that sustains you throughout life. And if it doesn't, then you need to look back at that empty tomb. And you need to see what really happened there and the implications for your life because it happened. Jesus appeared to the disciples as well. And in John's gospel, we read that he appeared to them a couple of times before we find Peter and six other disciples deciding at the Sea of Galilee that they want to go fishing. And that's what they do. Well, why does Peter and these guys, why do they go fishing? Maybe it's because it was familiar. Maybe it's because they were hungry. Maybe it's because they didn't know what else to do. At the end of chapter 20, Jesus says, I am sending you out. And he breathes on them the Holy Spirit. But what do you do with that? Maybe Peter and the others didn't know where to go. Maybe he didn't know where Jesus was sending them. Maybe they didn't know what to say. They didn't know what to do. And if they are like me, when you're uncertain, when you're unsure, you simply default to what is familiar. Fishing is familiar to Peter. And so he goes fishing. And they're fishing all night long. And they don't catch anything. Have you noticed that in Scripture when we read about Peter fishing, he never really catches anything. Without Jesus, Peter is a terrible fisherman. It's a good thing that Jesus made him a fisher of people because it doesn't appear that he was a very good fisher of fish. This is one example. All night, he doesn't catch anything. And he's fishing. And you can just see him tossing the net towing in the net, gathering the net, it's empty, do it again, toss the net, tow the net, gather the net, it's empty, do it again, time and time again. But my guess is his thoughts were far from fishing. My guess is he was replaying in his mind those conversations around that fire. He's thinking about how when he was asked three different times how he denied even knowing Jesus, following Jesus, he denied association with Jesus. My guess is that's what he's thinking about. And yet that train of thought is broken with a voice from a guy on the shore saying, hey, have y'all caught any fish yet? No, the disciples shout back, over the calm waters highlighted by the rising sun, it's morning by now. The voice from the shore says, well, throw your net on the other side and you will catch some fish. Who is this guy? The fish whisperer? What's he talking about? But we don't seem to see any resistance in the text. You just read that Peter and the other disciples acquiesce and they throw the net on the other side of the boat And what happens? Lo and behold, they pull in this huge catch of fish. Peter is so caught up in the moment, so wrapped up in the task at hand, that he misses the significance of the moment. But John doesn't. And you can almost see John's eyes as he's looking at this huge net bulging with fish, and then his eyes scan the horizon back to the voice that came from the shore. And John says the only thing he can say, it is the Lord. Verse 7 of chapter 21. It is the Lord. What does Peter do? Peter does what he always does. He reacts impulsively. He jumps into the water and begins to swim as hard as he can to the shore. What do you think is going through his mind as he's trying to swim? I mean, maybe primarily don't drown, but besides that, when I see Jesus, what am I going to say? What is he going to say? And so he's swimming to shore. The other disciples are dragging the fish, and they're in the boat, and they're coming to shore as well. And they all get to the shore, and what do they find? Peter walks up, dripping wet, 
to a fire of burning coals. On that fire is some fish already cooking, and there's some bread there. Do you have some sensory triggers? Are there certain smells that when you smell it, it takes you back to an earlier time, maybe your childhood, maybe a different place? Is there a certain song or songs that you hear that when you hear those songs, you are transported in time and space? What about a taste? You taste something, and it takes you somewhere else, maybe to grandma's house and the cobbler she used to make or the casserole. We all have those sensory triggers. I wonder, as Peter walked up dripping wet and he smelled the very distinct smell of the charcoal fire, if his mind immediately went back to that other fire. Maybe he was already thinking about that. I would have been full of regret and guilt, but maybe it was the fire that triggered the thought, oh yeah, last time I was around a fire, it was not good. I'm so ashamed, I'm so guilty, I'm so filled with regret. Jesus is there. The resurrected Jesus is there. He invites him to have breakfast with him. Get some more of those fish. Let's put them on the fire. Let's have breakfast together. And after breakfast, Jesus looks into Peter's eyes and he asks him a question. Now, if that's me, I'm going to ask Peter a question as well. And the question is going to be, why? Why did you do that? Why did you deny knowing me? Or how could you have done that? I mean, think about all that you saw me do, Peter. Think about all that I've done for you. How could you turn your back on me? I would have asked Peter, Peter, how do you expect me to forgive you? How in the world can I forgive you? But that's not the question that Jesus asked. That's not who Jesus is. Jesus asked a different question. John chapter 21, verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? These what? These fish? These other guys? All of this? We don't know for sure, but we know the question is, Peter, is your love durable? Are you with me? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, well, feed my lambs. Verse 16, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time. Isn't that ironic that Peter was hurt? Because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know, you know that I love you. The question is, do you love me? Jesus wanted to know if Peter's love had been singed, had been burned, had been destroyed by the fire, because Jesus knew that there would be future fires. Can I count on you? Do you love me? Is your love real and rugged enough to face the fires of life? And notice how many times Jesus asked him this question, three times, to correspond with Peter's three earlier denials. It is very clear that this story, paired with the previous story around the fire, is presented as a story of great forgiveness. That this story is about Jesus forgiving Peter. Jesus extended incredible mercy to Peter. He forgave him. He restored the relationship with him. I mean, this is the wife who forgives and takes back the adulterous husband. This is the persistent parent that embraces the wayward child. This is the judge that pardons the hardened criminal. Jesus restores his relationship with Peter. You see, Thomas might be known as the doubter. And Judas might be known as the betrayer. But as far as Jesus was concerned, Peter would not be known as the denier. Jesus says, I don't see you that way. Jesus didn't focus 
on the past. He didn't linger on the past. He looked to the future. Don't miss the significance of what happens around that fire. Think about what Peter had done. He had blatantly and willingly turned his back on Jesus. Jesus, according to our thinking, our logic and rational way of looking at things, had every right to shame Peter, or at least keep his distance from him. And yet Jesus chooses a different path. He chooses relationship with Peter and restores the relationship with Peter. He chooses forgiveness and mercy. What an incredible story. I want to tell you today, if you aren't perfect, then believe it or not, you fit right in with us here. Because you are sitting among a people who are not perfect. People who have or are currently or will face the fires of life, the fires of temptation, the fires of social pressure, the fires of loss, the fires of doubt, all of the fires that we know are out there. And so many times we have failed. So many times our faith has melted away. And those fires have prompted us to do what Peter did, to participate in these ugly denials of Jesus. For some, it's in our past. For others, it's right now. And for others, it's even hidden going on right now. See, there are people here who are allowing the world's way of thinking to infiltrate their minds. They're allowing Satan to turn them against God, against God's word, against God's people. There are others who are trying to hold on to their marriage by a thread because they are more focused on getting what they want rather than being the husband or the wife God has called them to be. There are some who are wrapped up in this battle with addiction, and so many days they are losing that battle. There are others who are living a double life, appearing as a Christian so often when people are watching, but when no one's around, doing and saying things that don't honor Christ. There are some who have so much baggage, so much of a painful, difficult past, they can't seem to get over it. Too many mistakes, too much regret, too much pain. If you feel like you have turned your back on Jesus, then I think Jesus invites you to the warm glow of the fire, to hear his conversation with Peter, because it's the same conversation he wants to have with you. And it goes something like this. It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. You see, no past is so dark and no sin is so great that it will keep Jesus from loving you. No matter what you've done in the past, no matter what you're dealing with now, no matter what you're trying to overcome or what will face you in the future, nothing, nothing is too much to keep Jesus from loving you. That is the message throughout the New Testament. That's the gospel. And that's why Paul would write in Romans chapter 8 that he was convinced that neither death nor life nor all these other things, nothing in all creation can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No matter how dark your past is, no matter how painful your current struggle is, it's not too much for Jesus to love you. But notice the conversation that day around that fire didn't end there. And neither does Jesus' conversation with you. Yes, Jesus forgave Peter. He restored Peter. But he also called him. Look back at the text. John chapter 21, verse 17. Jesus said, feed my sheep. This is the third time that he said this to Peter, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. 
Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. You see, Jesus forgives Peter, but he also calls him. He says, I have an important job for you. I need you to feed my sheep. I need you to be a shepherd. I need you to take care of my people. And if that's me watching this go down, I'm thinking, Jesus, wait a second. Do you know who this guy is? When has he ever shown himself to be trustworthy? I wouldn't let him watch after my people or my sheep or anything that I cared about. And yet Jesus trusts him. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing that God doesn't see us in our failures. God doesn't see us how we see ourselves. God sees us for who he made us to be, who we are called to be. And so Jesus calls Peter. And he does the same thing for us. When he restores us, he invites us. He calls us. He commissions us. He doesn't want us to stay where we are. Certainly, he doesn't want us to stay in our sin, in our struggle, in our darkness. He calls us into a new way of thinking, a new identity. We are a new creation. And it's from that place, from that identity, as a restored, forgiven, saved child of God, that we find purpose, that we find meaning, that we go about doing what we do every day. Jesus said to Peter, follow me. He called him to follow him. And he even gave him a glimpse of where that path would lead. Do you remember what he said? He said, one of these days, someone is going to stretch out your hands. You know what that means? Peter knew what it meant. He was going to be crucified. He was going to die a martyr. History tells us and tradition tells us that that's exactly what happened. That Peter was crucified, but he didn't want to be crucified the same way his Savior was crucified. He did not feel like he deserved that same honor, and so he was crucified upside down. When Jesus forgives us, when he restores us, he also calls us. And he calls us to live a life of discipleship. A life characterized by carrying one's cross. A life that will certainly face many fires. But when we face those fires, he assures us that he is with us. And that we can look beyond those fires to something so much more glorious. Certainly this past week, you heard the news and saw the news about Notre Dame on fire there in Paris. Incredible news story unfolding in front of the whole world. And it got so much attention, it's unfortunate that the three historically black churches in Louisiana that were burned by an arsonist didn't get near as much attention. But it's probably because of the 800-year history of Notre Dame probably because of its symbolism, probably because of its connection with so many people. Over 13 million people see it every year. Many of you, I know, have been there. And so people feel connected in some way. And so the world watched as this incredible ancient cathedral, this symbolism of so much meaning, was ablaze. The spire fell down, the roof began to collapse, and everyone's watching going, someone put out the fire. (laughs) Finally, they put out the fire. And they began to assess the damage. One of the very first images that came from inside the cathedral was this one. Maybe you saw it. And just for a moment, I want you to remove the background story. Remove the history. Remove the religion. I just want you to consume this picture. What does it say? What does it say? What does it communicate? To me, it's pretty clear. Amid the ashes of life, when the fires burn us. Look, there's still smoke in the picture. When all of this darkness and all of this destruction happens in this world, in our lives, there is one illuminating truth that rises above all of it. The cross of Jesus Christ. That no matter what happens, the cross still stands. And so does the empty tomb. 
And any rebuilding that's going to happen in our homes, in our marriages, in our lives, any rebuilding that's going to happen is going to have to be around the cross of Christ. You see, that's Peter's story. That's exactly what unfolds around that fire on the beach of the Sea of Galilee that day. That's also my story. And that's your story. And so we close with the same question that Jesus asked Peter that day around that fire. Simple question. The question is this. Do you love me? Do you love Jesus? I can assure you he loves you. Nothing you have done, nothing you will do can remove that love. But the question is, do you love him? He is pursuing you. Are you denying him? The easy answer is, well, yes, of course I love him. Jesus, you know everything. If you know I love you. Well, if you love him, and if you receive that restoration and that forgiveness he offers, remember that he calls you, that he invites you. So what does that mean? What is the next step on the path of discipleship for you? Maybe today it is to give your life to Christ. To say to the world, yes, I believe Jesus came to this earth. He died on that cross and he stayed in that tomb for a short while because God brought him out alive and well. and He is alive today. And I want to be baptized into Christ, clothed with Christ, living my life to honor him. We'd be happy to celebrate that with you today. Or maybe the next step on the path of discipleship for you is to be encouraged or to find support or to make some changes in your life. Some of the things we talked about earlier. If we can encourage you and pray for you, we'd certainly be honored to do that. We're going to stand and sing a song. We'll have a couple of shepherds and their wives in their parlor, a room right behind me. You can exit out any of these doors, make your way there. They'd be happy to receive you. Or you can come down to the front. And we will join together and lift you up in prayer. If there's something we can do, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.